If someone out there is really hesitating by saying, yeah, I don't really see any financial advantage of getting married, they might be right, but they're probably in the minority. Most of us, there is a significant financial advantage to getting married, as long as you're sure it's the right person. Marriage is a big decision, my friends, emotionally, spiritually, and financially. And with any big decision, it's important to weigh the pros and cons. So what are the financial pros and cons of marriage? Big questions like this are always better with really smart friends. So I thought I'd answer this one with Jesse Kramer. Jesse is an engineer by training, a writer by passion, and he works professionally for a fiduciary financial planning and wealth management firm, Cobblestone Capital Advisors. Jesse is also the voice behind the Best Interest blog and podcast, which was nominated by Plutus in 2022 as the personal finance blog of the year. When Jesse isn't supporting families with financial advice, he's spending time with his new wife, Kelly, in Rochester, New York. Welcome to the show, Jesse. Andy, thank you for having me on. That was a great introduction. I might have to copy that down actually for future, you know, biographies. That was perfect. Anytime, man. Anytime. Absolutely. I'm happy to introduce you. You're doing some great things out there and helping people out. So I'm happy to have you on the show and talk about this important topic. Also a a very relevant topic for you as a newly married man. So let's let's answer this question. (laughs) What are some of the major financial pros of marriage? Yeah, great, great question. I've I've got a little list here. We'll work our way through it. Some of them are officially recognized by the IRS and some of them are just things that you can do as a married couple on the side on your own. So we'll kind of just go through a bullet list and then maybe we can expand if you'd like. Uh, Usually married couples pay lower taxes. Not always, but usually. You can gift assets to one another without penalty, which for some married couples is is an important pro. You might get Roth contribution advantages. That has usually has to do with if, if one spouse it earns too much to make Roth contributions and the other spouse doesn't, there's a chance that their combined income might allow them both to make Roth contributions. And then you get into some of the, the budgeting stuff, sharing bills, economies of scale on things like rent or mortgage or utilities, or where there once were two bills, now there might only be one bill. Insurance, similar benefits to insurance. It's almost always cheaper to, to buy those benefits together. Kelly and I, for example, we save about $300 a month on health insurance by getting married and combining that health insurance. On the on the tail end, when you're retiring, there are social security benefits uh, for, for one of the two partners in marriage, because if the higher earning social security partner happens to die first, their living spouse inherits that higher uh, social security payment. And then a, a simple budgeting one, just combining credit or combining incomes when making big purchases, like something like a house. So that's my list, Andy. I love it, man. That's a good list. And I'm thinking personally, guys, just about uh, my marriage with Nicole. Uh, I always like to talk about net worth and like growing our net worth and things like that, or just the sheer, the sheer statement of saying, oh, I'm a millionaire, but I would not be a billionaire if it wasn't for my wife, Nicole, and the combined efforts that we both had uh, financially, emotionally, parentally around all the things that we've been doing. So our uh, my wealth is, is her wealth is our wealth. So absolutely combining our, our powers together uh, has been fantastic over the past uh, 13 years of our marriage. Uh, so I always like to point that out, but I always like looking at both sides of the story. So let's talk about the cons, the financial cons of marriage that maybe people don't talk about a lot, especially, you know, positive uh, marriage, positive dudes like me, because I don't really go <laughs> off on all the, the cons. So let's, let's, let's dive in. Cause it's good to look at both yeah, sides. Yeah, totally. And, and I think most of the cons that I'm aware of tend to be uh, behavioral in nature. And it's something like, you know, inheriting, for lack of a better term, inheriting your partner's bad habits or inheriting your partner's, you know, negative past, meaning like, like debt, you know, if it's not that when you get married that you officially take on your partner's debt, but now all of a sudden you're going to help them pay off their debt, assuming that you're loving marriage, married partners. A a lot of people choose that path that you're going to help your partner pay off the debt. And that's going to cost you. That's going to be a new negative in your financial life. Overspending and budgeting, you might be a very frugal person. If your partner isn't, that is going to have a net effect, a net negative effect on your side of the finances. Another big one is simply now answering to someone else. When you're single, you literally, you only have to answer to yourself. Your own your own bad choices, you answer for. Your own good choices, you get to relish in those 
when you're married to someone else, there's a, a lot of times fin financially and otherwise, as we know, where you have some responsibility in, in tackling your partner's problems, financial or otherwise. So that that's a net negative. And then the last one, it's, it's a downer, but divorce is really expensive and divorce only happens after marriage. And it's just so <laughs> something you really want to be sure about getting into, a, into marriage. It's, it's not only this uh, bond of love, but it's also a bond legally and it's a bond financially. Separating those bonds is painful emotionally. It's also painful for your wallet. Yeah, I think these are these are really good things to point out and good things that people as maybe as they're listening right now, they're like, ah, oh, yeah, that's true. I do love my <laughs> spouse, but yeah. You know what I'm thinking about? Just yeah. I'll, I'll be, uh, you know, a little self-deprecation here. I, I feel like since I enjoy talking about money, sometimes I can get probably a little controlling of, of the money too. And I and I know that's probably something I know that I, 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 I grab onto maybe as a man or just generally in general, somebody who's interested in the money. And with that, maybe I can become slightly more selfish. And so what I have to do to push myself to be less selfish is to make sure that I'm meeting with my wife on a weekly basis to go over those numbers. Even though she doesn't care about hearing about the numbers, I want her buy-in and I want her collaboration to make sure that this that this plan that we're talking about is equitable and fair in our relationship. And she sees that as well, because my my version of equitable and fair might be different from her vision of a uh, version of equitable and fair. So let's talk about decreasing those cons and the importance of maybe communicating like this. Yeah, I mean it's funny, Andy. You know, you you sent me a couple questions to think about beforehand, and one of your questions was right ways to decrease these cons before marriage or during marriage. And the answer I wrote out is talk, 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 plan, plan, plan that's really where it starts and and hearing your story about about meeting every week and 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 going over those uh going over those finances that is both the talking and the planning it's so invaluable because outside of those options talking and planning wh what would you do strong arm your spouse into changing their behavior yell at them for spending too much i mean like you you get to a point where you say there's not much you can do except talk about this stuff plan slowly over time start to adjust or get used to one another's behaviors, cut each other some slack, those kind of things. But it really comes down to open communication, by far the number one most important thing. Absolutely. And I, I think without that communication, or I guess without the collaboration, things like financial infidelity can make their way into the relationship, financial abuse, or just, I guess, dishonesty in general. So having those times set up can be that cornerstone for your relationship, that building block for your relationship on trust, honesty, and transparency. So we, we talked a little bit about divorce because some of these things could lead to divorce. What are your thoughts on a prenup when it comes to getting married? Do you feel like this is something that married couples or engaged uh, and dating couples should consider before tying the knot? That's a really interesting question. Personally, I mean, I can tell you that we did not sign a prenup. Uh, but part of the reason why is because Kelly and I, we have similar uh, current states of our finances, like, you know, relatively similar net worth, relatively similar salaries, relatively similar long-term prospects. There's not much difference between us. You know, a, a prenup is essentially some sort of agreement that says uh, because of these large differences between spouses or because of the potential large differences in the future, we're going to set some expectations before marriage of what might happen if we split up. And, and it's important to kind of talk about what those disparities, what those differences might be. If one spouse is already wealthy and the other one is not. If one spouse is super indebted and the other one's not. If one spouse is likely to miss out on the workforce for a long period of time, which is kind of an interesting one because essentially what that's saying is if one spouse is planning on being, say, a stay-at-home mom for a large duration of the marriage, that mom, she's going to be missing out on a lot of years on the workforce and a lot of years in salary. And that puts her at a financial disadvantage to her husband, whose career is still, you know, progressing. He's earning more and more every year. She put her career on pause to raise the kids. That might introduce a financial disparity at some point in the marriage and might be worth thinking about some sort of prenup for. A large inheritance could be another one if, you know, one spouse is expecting a large inheritance. If one spouse has previous children or had previous divorces, that might be worth something thinking about. Now, 
I'm not a lawyer. As far as I know, Andy, you're not a lawyer either. No, so this no. is the kind of thing that you'd <laughs> want to discuss with a, a family lawyer, a divorce attorney, someone who practices some form of family law. But those are the kind of questions when one spouse has a large disparity over the other that typically trigger a prenup. I, I think that is a great point. And I really like your point on the stay-at-home mom plan because a lot of the times that can be a, a point and period of time where there's no income coming in, but the contribution, I know from our standpoint, because my wife stayed at home for you know five, seven years, contribution was much higher on her side than it was it, it, with my my work that I was doing as I was bringing in, bringing in the money. Uh, the contribution to raise two small children is... <laughs> The, during during that period of time, I would take like, hey, you want to go? You want to go to you know go on a, a girlfriend's trip or something like that? I would stay at home with the kids for four or five days. And my lack of practice on the realities of what it takes to raise children was eye opening. I'll just tell you, Jesse. So I, I would just say that um, having that ability to create some sort of uh, fairness and equity in the relationship, mm. setting that a set, setting that uh, up ahead of time is probably a really smart way to go. So let's talk about ways that uh, maybe you are building that trust and transparency and honesty in your new relationship as a as a new husband. What what things do you and Kelly do that kind of bring that bond so you guys can keep this thing going for uh you know for decades and decades to come and maybe avoiding that seven year itch like like some couples do? Well it's it's fun. It's a funny question. Right now Kelly is in business school. She's finishing next month, one month away. And the combination of kind of my career change, Kelly being in business school we're transitioning from a small starter home to hopefully our forever home. Our lives have been so busy, especially over, say, the last six months, that it's funny. It's It has been hard to, uh, hard to find time for that regular communication. That said, even when we are a bit overwhelmed, we always try to spend some quality time together, especially on the weekends. Um, just, you know, some one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's like date time or just relaxing time to have some of these important conversations that we're talking about today. Or even something, we have dogs, we foster dogs as well. Um, but something like a 30 minute dog walk, leaving the phone and the headphones at home, it's just us and the dog and nature. I mean, that's a perfect time to start talking about some of these important conversations that, that we're talking about here. Forget about the, the daily, the, the notifications on the phone and the, and the computer and the email and just talk about this life planning type topic. I think that's great. And, you know, even if we don't, let's say we don't meet every week or every month or whatever your scheduled plan is, we at least have it up here in our brains that know that it's just like taking care of your health. Okay, maybe I don't exercise every day like I should, but I know that I should be. So it's sort of the same thing with your marriage. You got to exercise <laughs> the communication in your marriage and at least make that plan to come back to it if you have gone away from it for a while so that you can keep this great marriage going. So Jesse, there's somebody listening right now and they are considering marriage. They're engaged or they're young or they're figuring it out and they're thinking, well, you know what? Financially, I don't think marriage is worth it. I think that uh, maybe I, I'm just going to pass and just kind of control my own life and maybe I'll just date somebody. What would you say to that person? I, mean, I would say that the, the financial advantages of marriage are definitely real. No, I mean, no doubt about it, right? And I think if you really want to get down to brass tacks, countries have, a, have an incentive to have more children. And I really mean that, you know, as a country, as a nation, we need more children to keep our economy running and to ensure that our country moves along. And the way that Congress stimulates that or the way that Congress incents having children is by providing financial advantages to married couples, by providing financial advantages to eventually having children. So if someone out there is really hesitating by saying, yeah, I don't really see any financial advantage of getting married, they might be right, but they're probably in the minority. Most of us, there is a significant financial advantage to getting married, as long as you're sure it's the right person. There you go. Absolutely. And, and in order to have that assurance, if you are worried, a prenup can be a great idea. That way you're going into it uh, with your ducks in a row, with the agreements that you had together as a couple. And yeah, if it doesn't work out, like sometimes 40 to 50% of marriages you you guys have a plan at least. And uh, so I, I like the prenup. It's funny enough for me to say I like the prenup because I also didn't get a prenup too, Jesse, with my wife and I. We, we, we got together. We both uh, had nothing uh, and we got together 
<laughs> together and uh, we grew we grew what we have together so everything that is ours is now ours together so right. J- jesse this is a great conversation i really appreciate you jumping on and and having it with me talk to us about the best interest and where people can connect with you and what what it's all about best interest is a, a website i started a little over four years ago when i was still working as a mechanical engineer i was the guy at work who was kind of the personal finance nerd helping people out with their 401k decisions and they encouraged me to start writing which i did and It's been amazing. The address is bestinterest.blog. Jesse, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Andy. This is great.